Thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight uh, at the University of Pennsylvania Carey Law School. Um, this is the keynote for the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law's conference entitled Autocrats, Tech Assault, and Democracy's Response. We've had a wonderful program today and we'll continue it tomorrow. Uh, I want to thank um, our co-sponsors, Perry World House and the Andrea Mitchell Center for their assistance with putting this together. Um, I want to welcome all of you, but I particularly want to uh, welcome the very well-educated uh, students from St. Joe's Prep uh, and their faculty uh, accompaniment. Um, thank you for joining us, and we hope you, uh, hope you enjoy the panel. Um, I went to one of their rival Jesuit schools. So I, I, I had to say that. Um, this is going to be a fascinating uh, panel discussion. Um, Claire uh, Finkelstein is going to uh, introduce the uh, uh, panelists. Um, but first, I'm Paul Haga. I'm the executive board chair of Searle. Um, I'm also, uh, in, my, in other parts of my life, I'm the board chair of National Public Radio. Uh, and today you will hear description of a lot of problems and you will hear solutions. And I can't let the moment pass uh, without telling you the obvious solution to all of this, which is get off social media and listen to NPR. <laughs> For those of you who are, who are here, it's WHYY, which we are also partners. 90.9, .9, and it's run by uh, Kira McGrath, a Penn Carey Law School grad. So we're, uh, we're all family here. Uh, I'm going to introduce Claire's founder and faculty director, Claire Finkelstein, but she's going to introduce the distinguished panelists. But let me just tell you quickly about Searle, Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law. Our mission, we're a nonpartisan, interdisciplinary institute dedicated to preserving and promoting ethics and the rule of law in national security democratic governance, conflict, and war. Now, what does that mean? We have four ways of doing that. One, we educate the public. We have book talk series, public keynote addresses with, uh, with high-level officials. We have blog postings. We have social media. Second, we educate students, as we are doing today. Summer internship programs in, in which students take a deep dive into pressing national security issues and have the ability to interact at a high level with national security professionals, and they also plan our programs like this one that's uh, going on tonight. Uh, we influence policy. We draft a series of policy papers on pressing national security topics, and we hold briefings at the Pentagon for JAG lawyers. We've also recently begun engaging in litigation by filing amicus briefs and FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Act. Uh, and finally, fourth, we advance academic thought. Um, we publish a series of academic volumes with the Oxford Unity University Press entitled Ethics, National Security, and the Rule of Law. I would encourage you, if you're interested or have questions, go to our website or ask any of our uh, Searle uh, staff about it. Tonight's program, actually today's program and tonight's program, really touches on all four of the areas in which we, uh, we work. Claire Finkelstein is the Algernon Biddle Professor of Law and Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania Carey Law School. In 2019, she was named Senior Fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. An expert in the law of armed conflict, military ethics, and national security law, she's co-editor of the Oxford Theories in Ethics, National Security, and the Rule of Law. And in 2012, she founded this wonderful Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law here at Penn Carey Law School. So thank you, and I hope you enjoy the uh, program tonight. Thanks so much. Uh, just before I introduce our panelists, uh, while we are busy talking about the dangers of technology, please silence your cell phones uh, so that we won't be interrupted in that conversation. Uh, I'm delighted to have uh, this wonderful panel here uh, to talk about uh, technology and autocracy. Uh, the genesis of this project for Searle was that uh, we have been thinking a lot about um, risk to democratic governance uh, and worrying a lot about what we see uh, and many people see as a kind of decline of democratic norms uh, across the world. 
uh, and observing such declines right here at home. Uh, as we focused on this and also witnessed the increase of autocratic governance uh, around the world as well as uh, an increase in right-wing illiberal parties, um, even in, uh, in countries that still are considered democracies, um, and thought about these threats, uh, we happened to come across uh, an article, The Autocrat's New Toolkit, uh, written here um, by Kara and Richard. And, and that sort of changed our thinking about how we were going to approach the topic of autocracy. Uh, because we suddenly started uh, really thinking deeply about the relationship between the rise of autocracy and the rise of technology. So we're, go we're going to be talking about uh, that relationship and asking questions about whether or not there is a causal relationship, uh, if so, what we can do to counter it, uh, and if not, then how we think about uh, the development, the technological developments and how they relate uh, to our efforts to preserve democracy and to, and to counter the rise of autocracy. Uh, so first, uh, to my far left here is Kara Friedrich. Uh, she is a fellow for technology and national security at the Center for New American Security. Before joining CNAS, uh, Kara helped create and lead Facebook's global security counterterrorism analysis program. Kara previously served as an analyst for US Naval Special Warfare Command and for the Department of Defense. Uh, to my immediate left, Richard Fontaine is the Chief Executive Officer of CNAS. He was the President of CNAS from uh, 2012 to 2019. Prior to that, Richard was Foreign Policy Advisor to Senator John McCain and worked at the State Department, National Security Council, and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Um, first, uh, now to my right, David Cole is the National Legal Director for the ACLU. He is also the George J. Mitchell Professor in Law and Public Policy at Georgetown. Uh, David is the author of 10 books, and he has litigated many constitutional cases in the Supreme Court, including Texas against Johnson and U.S. against Eichmann. Uh, and finally, uh, to my far right here, uh, not politically speaking, is Marwan Crady, uh, a <laughs> professor of communication uh, and the Anthony Shadid Chair in Global Media Politics and Culture as well as the founding director of the Center for Advanced Research in Global Communication, or CARG, at the Annenberg School for Communication. Um, Marwan has published 13 books and edited volumes and has won numerous awards for his teaching and his scholarship. We're delighted to have you with us. Um, so, to kick off our discussion, uh, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to talk a little bit about how they uh, got involved in this subject and, and what their interests are. And I'm going to start with Kara here uh, on my left. Uh, this article that I referred to, the Autocrats and the Toolkit, has become something of a, um, has a little bit of a cult following, uh, we might say now. <laughs> it has, as everything does on the internet uh, these days, we have to say it's gone viral. Uh, and um, as, as I even learned today that, that some uh, guy did a theater production based on it in his basement. Uh, so there's been an enormous amount of attention to this article. Can you tell us how you first started thinking about it, uh, with Richard, of course, and, uh, and, and what your primary conclusion was? Certainly. So um, what I've learned, thank you for having me, but what I've learned with the introductions right now is that I need to start writing books, apparently. <laughs> yeah. So do I. <laughs> well, um, but one thing I think that's anathema to people who are looking to make uh, concrete, actionable policy recommendations is fighting the last war. So we often think, you know, we turning and looking backwards and assessing the situation, while very important, if we're liaising with uh, policymakers like we're trying to do at the Center for New American Security and really inform effective policy, we have to kind of see what's happening next. Um, so we're, we were in a, a briefing with a, a small delegation from a foreign country, and one of the technology ethicists uh, sort of asked us, um, you know, what, what are the, what's the big issue of our day, uh, which Richard, I'll, I'll let him answer the, in the broad contours, um, but specifically, what do we see as the top five technologies in the future that stand to really alter this balance between authoritarians and democracies or democratic systems of governance? And um, I was sort of uh, making sketches, noodling in uh, the briefing on my time at Facebook, where 
Um, obviously, micro-targeting was a, a big issue in 2016 and whatnot, but we wanted to see, okay, what, what does that look like at scale? What does that look like when it's automated? What does it look like when it stands to impact geopolitics? Because as you likely have talked about over um, the course of the day, uh, the geopolitical cognition in a lot of these private big tech companies, it wasn't always there. We're sort of always in my time there, you're looking for the technical fix. You're looking for the technical solution. You're looking to ship and you're looking to scale, but you're not necessarily, at least uh, two years ago, you're not necessarily looking at how is this going to impact the world? How is this going to matter politically? Uh, what should we do to enshrine some of these protections so that we don't necessarily tip the balance in a way that a free and democratic country wouldn't like to see into perpetuity? Um, so uh, we came up with five of these technologies that we think would, would sort of change the game. Uh, facial recognition and other sorts of digital surveillance technologies. Um, automated micro-targeting again. Um, synthetic media, you've probably all heard of deep fakes or at least seen those weird, scary Steve Buscemi and Jennifer Lawrence mashups that are pretty unnerving. Um, and then uh, lifelike bots, as well as these uh, computer language models that use natural language processing to sort of uh, have the idea of uh, purveying false information at scale. So we looked at this and we, we basically wrote an article about how this could stand to impact uh, the course of how these countries interact with each other. Uh, and Richard basically came up with the title on the fly and uh, people, people caught on. So that's, that's the genesis and hopefully it made a contribution. Certainly did. Richard, let me ask you now um, to go back a little bit further to when you were first working on the Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned to me that you drafted a bill on the victims of Iranian censorship that, that first had you thinking a little bit about technology and the, and the relationship to autocracy. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and what's happened to those thoughts since? Sure. Um, thanks for having us here. Of course. It's great to be here, um, especially with high school students. So. Um, in 2009, when the Green Revolution in Iran um, unfolded and then ultimately was, was uh, put down, um, there was a lot of momentum on Capitol Hill to do something in response to that. And so different offices were thinking about drafting sanctions legislation and stuff like that, which is always kind of a go-to thing. And I was working for Senator McCain at the time, and um, I had been really struck by the repression of the internet that had happened there. Um, the, the repression of social media uh, with which um, uh, individuals were trying to organize protests, but also the, uh, you know, basically compromising accounts so that the uh, regime could uh, grab information um, and, and map out online what previously you would have had to do in sort of real space with real people and things like that. And so I, um, I, I worked with some folks to draft this bill, the Victims of Iranian Censorship Act, which ultimately passed into law. And what this thing did was, um, make uh, funds available for the provision of circumvention technologies and for encryption technologies that could be used by Iranians to basically uh, have access to a more unfiltered, uh, uncensored internet and a free flow of information and be able to communicate with each other without the watchful eye of the uh, regime uh, sort of coming into place. And you know, I did some work on internet freedom and, and things at CNES over the years. And, and if you look at where the democracies and the autocracies are today, there's been, you know, if you look at Freedom House does an annual report and, you know, there's been about a 13 year decline in the number of democracies in the world. And if you watch, I don't know, any news channel today, uh, you can see that the quality of the still existing democracies are not exactly at their acme right now. Uh, you know, whether it's us, but also look at, you know, um, Brexit and, and the, the new elections in the United Kingdom, the Israelis are going to go to a third election because they can't form a government. I mean, you know, democracy is, is under some pressure and it's under pressure internally, but it's also under pressure uh, because the autocratic uh, countries of the world wish it to be uh, uh, under pressure, as we saw in the 2016 election with the Russian meddling uh, in, the, uh, in the U.S. election. And so if you look at this balance in the world, as Kara was saying, between autocracy and democracy, you know, autocracy is doing a little better than it used to be doing, and democracy is not doing quite as well. And so it was very interesting to me what the role of technology is in all of this. And after 2016, there was a lot of focus on disinformation because of the specific things that the Russians did in the United States. Um, and when Karen and I were talking about it, um, disinformation, of course, is interesting, but we thought that was a piece of kind of the last war. The most interesting thing to us was, what are the technologies that are 
maturing now or, or will mature in the future, it could be used by autocrats either to better repress their own people, to make their own regimes more effective in economic terms, for example, or to meddle or disrupt democracies abroad, and that's kind of what we try to focus on. Right, and, and, and one of the things that we'll be talking about is the way that technology may help autocrats concentrate power. I think that's one of the, one of the central things that your article helped to bring out, which is that these techniques have a, have a direct impact. Indeed, um, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, um, who uh, wrote an article called Why Technology Favors Tyranny and has written uh, several uh, extremely popular books, wrote that the main handicap of authoritarian regimes in the 20th century, the desire to concentrate all information and power in one place, may become their decisive advantage in the 21st century. So with that lead in, David, um, you became the uh, national uh, director of the ACLU uh, 11 days before Trump came into office. Uh, and it has, uh, it's been quite an interesting few years for you, but one of the remarks that you made to me was that technology has actually been an important platform for you in um, in fighting this administration. Yeah, so I, I'm the national legal director. Excuse me. Um, uh, and I was, was hired actually uh, in the summer of 2016. Um, so think back to the summer of 2016. Okay. The executive director of the ACLU came to Washington to encourage me to apply for this job. Uh, and he said, you know, David, how could you not uh, apply for this job? You know, you've been uh, litigating constitutional law, teaching constitutional law, writing about constitutional law for your entire career under a conservative majority Supreme Court. Just think what it would be like to lead the ACLU <laughs> with a liberal majority Supreme Court. And of course, in the summer of 2016, what did we all know, including Donald Trump? We knew Hillary Clinton was going to win. She was going to appoint Justice Scalia's successor. And for the first time since 1972, we would have a liberal majority Supreme Court. Um, so I signed up on the bottom line, you know, and I uh, fully expected a kind of uh, to be to be leading a, a charge of, of of our lawyers and figuring out how we could advance liberty and defend rights with a sympathetic uh, court for the first time in four decades. Obviously, things changed on November uh, 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 November eighth, and things changed really quite dramatically for the ACLU. And I think they illustrate these changes illustrate. Uh, the sort of flip side of what we're talking about today, we're talking in, in, in large part about the role that um, technology and social media in, in, uh, play in the, uh, the abuse of power, but um, I think we shouldn't lose sight of the role that uh, technology and social media can play in resistance to the abuse of power. So um, ju and, and it was just some uh, examples, um, you know, we saw uh, within four months of President Trump's election, the largest march uh, in U.S. history in the Women's March. The largest march in U.S. history. And it was organized in four months' time, from nothing to this massive, uh, across the country, across the world, march against what Trump uh, stood for. That could not have happened uh, without the Internet, without social media. Uh, at the ACLU, um, you know, people often say, well, you know, how's it going? You started right before Trump was elected. I say, not too bad. Before I started working for the ACLU, we had 400,000 members. Today we have 1.8 million members. I must be doing something right. Um, you know, and then my daughter says, no, actually, Dad, there's a difference between causation and correlation. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I don't think I can take credit for those members other than my dad, maybe. But, uh, you know, Donald Trump gets credit. But, you know, but, but in fact, it's the American people who get credit, who, who saw a threat and decided to engage uh, to, 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 to try to fight back. And, but, but we could not have grown from 400,000 to 1.8 million without the internet and without social media, without the ability to get the word out to potential um, uh, you know, supporters, and without it, make, without it being so easy to become a member of the ACLU uh, as it is today. So an uh, example of that, the Muslim ban. The first thing Trump did on the Friday of the first week in his office was to b ban people from predominantly Muslim countries from coming into this country. Came out on a Friday afternoon. We had filed a lawsuit, the first lawsuit in the country, that night. 
on behalf of two Iraqi men who um, had gotten visas for their work with the US Army and then were barred by the Muslim ban from coming in. And they were held at JFK. We sued. That night, we had an emergency hearing um, the, the next night, Saturday night, in Brooklyn. And what happened on that weekend? Tens of thousands of American people went out to airports across this country to protest the Muslim ban. And that wouldn't have happened without the internet, without social media, without people tweeting and saying, you know, what, what are you doing today? Well, I'm watching, you know, the, the football game. I have a better idea. Let's go out to the airport and demonstrate against the Muslim ban. Remarkable. But tens of thousands of people did that, uh, and it wouldn't have happened, I don't think, without, uh, without Twitter and without uh, Facebook. That weekend alone, that weekend alone, we, we had 330,000 new members. So in one weekend, we almost doubled our membership. Again, that wouldn't have happened. Think of that if it was 10 years earlier, and you didn't have the internet, you didn't have the you know, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. You know, people might have read about the fact that we filed a lawsuit. They might have read about the, in the New York Times about the fact that we, you know, we got the first na nationwide injunction against the Muslim ban. And then, they, then you know, maybe a week later, they might have gotten a direct mail from us. Uh, right. And then they might have bothered to you know, open it. And then they might have bothered to take out their checkbook and write a check. And then they might have looked for a stamp. And you know, they might have mailed it back to us. And we might have gained some members. But we gained you know, 330,000 members in one single weekend. We, we, we launched, we launched uh, a grassroots um, uh, network you know, because we had all these new members. And they were coming to us and saying, hey, we're happy to have the card, but we don't want to just have the card. We want to do something to stand up for liberty. So we created something called People Power. It sounds very 60s-ish. But again, it would not be possible without social media, without the internet. And what it, what it does is it encourages people in their local communities to come together as ACLU volunteers and engage in concrete, real-world activism for uh, civil liberties um, uh, uh, to advance, you know, examples include urging your uh, lo local sheriff or police department to adopt immigrant-friendly law enforcement policies, or or urging your state legislature to adopt um, uh, reforms that increase access to the vote. All of that is coordinated through social media. It, that's how we encourage people to do it. That's how we connect people who are likely volunteers in particular um, uh, locations. That's how we get them to you know, show up to demonstrations and the like. And that program went from zero people who had joined people power and taken a concrete action in the real world to, to defend liberty, uh, zero in 2017, to 550,000 people um, who had taken action. We're not the only ones. The Indivisible, right? Indivisible was created by a couple of congressional staffers who wrote a, a, a memo on how you can affect Congress as a, you know, and that's about the most boring thing, you know, as Richard can tell you, know. one of the most <laughs> boring things. And a little close to the bone over yeah. here. <laughs> and and, it, and it, it went viral, uh, and it, start, it launched a movement, and there are now indivisible chapters across this country of people who've come together because of social media to fight back against uh, against Donald Trump. But, but let, me, let me get Marwan in on this conversation because this is exactly your expertise, which is popular culture and its relationship to technology. And, and in your writing about this, um, you talk about uh, the same sort of thing, the organization uh, of, of dissent, but also um, the difficulties that technology creates for those same movements. So Absolutely. So, so one of the things that David mentioned, which is a huge... Um, a positive of technology is the speed with which things happen, right? So instead of taking two to three weeks for you to cash those checks coming in the mail with the stamps and the glue and the saliva, uh, you get people clicking a link, entering their credit card information, and it's done. The problem with democracy, speed is not necessarily good for democracy. Speed favors uh, emotional contention over deliberative argument. Um, and speed favors the kind of um, um, very performative, very sensationalistic um, 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 uh, movements and rhetoric. Um, speed tends to skip over uh, or skirt around the edges of the truth. Right? Democracies are hard work that is slow, that takes time. And so, so on the one hand, you have movements being able to mobilize. You can put a million people on the mall in Washington, or in Tahrir Square, or on the Maidan in, in, in the Ukraine. Uh, what technology is much less good at is turning these million people into 
20, 30, or 40 competitive candidates for parliament or for city hall. Um, so, so, so turning this, this, this uh, uh, protest that's on the street, that's occupying public space, into actual political power is, is, is difficult, right? And we've seen it over and over again that you have um, um, optimism goes very high because you see millions of people on the streets and they're demanding that um, the government falls and you have typically a, a rival dictator or one figure that's sacrificed but the regime itself stays alive precisely because there's no positive agenda to replace it. Uh, and I think that's a big problem, right? Why is it a problem? It's a problem because once you control a government and this is something that I think we neglect to discuss in, in discussions of, of technology, um, the language of social media uh, the rhetoric around digital technology tends to talk about decentralization, about networking, about the cloud. All this vocabulary tends to suggest it's something out there in, in the air, something virtual. Um, all these depend on actual physical infrastructure, and this physical infrastructure tends to be controlled by governments. And this is something we don't, we don't talk about, we don't think about very often, and I'm not talking about undersea cables. I'll give you a few examples. Um, uh, fellows at, for example, at, at the Center for Advanced Research in Global Communication here at Penn. So, for example, in, in Sierra Leone, um, in Guinea, in Benin, um, you've had um, governments manipulating um, um, cell phone plans so that if you have some kind of, if you have activism going on on Twitter around a movement, around a hashtag, um, you go on your computer terminal, you enter a few lines of code, and you can really, you can either choke the, 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 the bandwidth, or you can tax it, so people will, you incentivize people to use it less, or you can block it, mm -hmm. right? And this is something that an invisible uh, programmer, bureaucrat can do from a government building, and it takes a while for people to notice. They notice speed, internet speed going down. Your data plan is not functioning uh, very well. We also have um, the internet works on physical nodes that connect different networks with each other. Uh, most of these nodes um, tend to be located in identifiable physical buildings, right? And so it's very easy for a dictatorship to flip a switch and not perhaps darken an entire country, but at least parts of it, or a city where there's a big demonstration. You can choke bandwidth, and this is a, a, a very big deal, right? You can also do a variety of things. Um, it, we used to think of it in terms of freedom and control, in terms of you either <coughs> completely blocked um, or you're completely free. And one of the most interesting things that I think remain understudied and, and not very well understood are the positions on that spectrum, from debit being choked to, you know, suddenly you can text, but you can't attach a picture to your text. You know, all those, uh, um, this, you know, you mentioned calibrating earlier when we were chatting about this. Uh, this is an incredible tool in the hand of, um, of autocrats that the only entities that can counter that are the very big platforms that tend to be located in the U.S. and in Western Europe. Yeah. Right, right? So, so, so let's um, step back for a second and we'll get more into some of the details. But the, the, the question that I want to pose to really um, get our interactive discussion going is the question of causation. Um, and, and I'll sort of go back. It's wonderfully organized with, with the two of you sort of on the problem side of technology and the two of you maybe on the um, upside of technology with some downside here. But um, just to ask you, to, to um, either of you really, to think about the ca potential causal relationship between these technological tools and the growth of autocracy. So are these two unrelated phenomena, or are these, is this new toolkit, in fact, um, helping to grow uh, autocratic governments around the globe? Richard, maybe you want to? Yeah, sure. I, I think that it is a factor. Um, it's hard to parse out how much of a factor and how much of it is causation, um, but in a couple of different ways. One, uh, you know, if you look at, um, well, look back at why communism failed. It failed for several reasons. One, it was an awful political system. You didn't have any freedoms, but you also didn't get any of the material stuff you wanted because there were no price signals and socialism it was an awful economic system and people stood in bread lines and all this other stuff, right? Authoritarian capitalism is a different system where you sort of have this implicit bargain where you get materially better in exchange for not having a whole lot of freedom as long as you stay out of politics and things like that. Technology makes that a more, 
to the degree to which there's central planning in that, which in the China's model, for example, there is a lot of central planning and big industrial policy and all this other kind of stuff, then, then that makes that a more feasible course of action that at least arguably buys you greater space in which you can have that bargain hold, where the bargain that uh, stay out of politics and let the party run everything and you know you don't have access to full information, but you're always going to be richer next year than you are this year, that makes that a more effective proposition um, because of, of the way technology is used um, and because of the metering that is able to be done. So we were talking about this earlier, but if you're in China and you're a stockbroker in in Shanghai, you will have access to much more information about what's going on in the world and a much freer ability to communicate than if you're a Uyghur in Xinjiang, right? Um, and that's because the stockbroker in, uh, in, in Shanghai is seen as an economic asset to the country and not a political threat, per se, and the Uyghurs seen as, per se, a political threat because of their religion and not very much of an economic asset. And so technology allows a, an autocracy to be able to meter those things. Um, it, it, it allows um, autocracies to be uh, effective, you know, at least the most sort of well-developed technological um, uh, autocracies to be um, better at population control right. um, and much more precise about population control. Less of the meat cleaver of, you know, the population is all controlled one way or it's not, um, and, and to be much more precise and to centralize data. And then finally, it, it helps you do things to other democracies, so, so I think or to democracy. If I, I'm going to turn to Kara in a minute about these um, specifics of these techniques, but Richard, I think you're saying that, that um, what technology has allowed autocracies to do is to flourish economically at the same time that they have concentrated uh, power, which is not what we were used to seeing. That is, we expected that you had to have a free market economy in order for a country to flourish economically. And, and technology has somehow made it possible for autocratic governments um, to, to flourish economically despite uh, the fact that they don't have free markets. Well, in that? Yeah, and China's exhibit A of why so many <coughs> of us who thought, well, inevitably China has to liberalize because, that, that, and it would, in fact, it's going backwards under Xi Jinping. And it's going backwards, you know, People thought, well, China has to liberalize, as Bill Clinton said, because ideas don't stop at the borders as long as you're traded, right? And then, you know, the flow of information is inherently liberalizing, right? People will always sort of choose to be more liberal than to be not liberal and things like that. And, um, and then ultimately, the so-called dictator's dilemma, which was fashionable as recently as sort of five or six or seven years ago, which said a dictator can either choose control of his population or you can choose economic growth. But if you're going to control your population and restrict their access to information, particularly in a world that is run on information, increasingly service-oriented, you can't have high economic growth. So you're either North Korea or you know, you're the United States. Well, that's now obviously wrong because information is highly <coughs> controlled inside China and their economic growth rate is higher than the United States. Right, exactly. So, so is it technology that's done that? And, and I want to turn to you, Kara, for a minute and just talk about um, the extremes of surveillance technology in China and sort of how that might be playing into uh, the concentration of power um, and how is that compatible with the economic growth? So I'll remark on something um, that Richard said and I think this concerns me and, and people are, have been talking about it for a little while now but I see instead of the, the causal relationship, technology is a tool. Um, and the, the thing that I'm concerned about is how we can actually imbue technology with values. And uh, we uh, are setting about to try to do that, to, to basically ensure that the technology that we're putting out into the world, that we're propagating to other nations that aren't necessarily democratic, um, is imbued with a sense of openness. Uh, where the internet was created imbued with democratic values and that openness and that transparency. Uh, so I think it's really important to, instead of importing values of censorship, like when uh, some of you high schoolers might use TikTok, you guys probably do. Um, in, yeah, right. <laughs> but in terms of uh, you know the the some of the interviews with um, people who have previously worked at TikTok, saying they're sort of censoring. Uh, these applications and whatnot. So when American 
uh, teenagers use technology that has been imbued with the values of censorship, that value flow is going in the wrong direction. You know, we're used to uh, a, a technological world that was built on openness and transparency, and now uh, the reality is not necessarily going to be that way for, for the rest of, um, you know, at least the next few decades. So I think that's something to think about. In well, let me stop you there for one minute and just, um, I want to um, briefly talk about, and feel free to, to jump in if you have anything to add here. Um, and I'm going to get back to our subjects over here in a minute. But um, in the article, uh, you talk about um, surveil smart cities, the possibility that we might end up living in a smart city and that China is already sort of on the, on the road to this. So you walk into a store and, and as you walk through, the, um, you hear a voice that says, you know, um, hello, Ms. Friedrich. Uh, here are the goods that you've been most recently looking at on the internet, right? And they're in aisle five. Or um, that all of your personal information will be somehow transparent and that, that police might be able to track your movements and, and so on. Um, interestingly, I was briefly living in Switzerland at the moment that Switzerland was starting to go to um, traffic cameras. And there was such an outcry there, the thought that, that our autonomy would be interfered with uh, that Swiss autonomy would be interfered with with these traffic cameras. They were absolutely furious about it. And of course, now we're used to them. We live with them. So, um, you know, describe a world for us in which we live with. You might say, uh, is it perfect transparency? But yet, it's it's. Yeah, so that's interesting, and I'm sure everyone's heard of, you know, the fact that technology is dual use. Um, um, mostly it was that originated in military context, um, but you can, it, there are, there's a lot of arguments to be made that technology, and we said this in the article, it makes our, our quality of life improve. Um, emergency response times are, have been shown to improve uh, through the use of smart cities. Um, it's when the surveillance is used for gross human rights abuses, like Xinjiang is an obvious uh, example, um, then I think we, we need to start thinking about that. I don't want to overstate the technological prowess of, of China at this point, though, uh, just like we had in the US government. Um, there are huge issues of platform interoperability. You know, Getting systems to talk to each other is very difficult, even in a place uh, like the United States. So I don't want to overstate that. Yet, um, people have been doing great work in terms of the Human Rights Watch. They reverse engineered an application called the Integrated Joint Operations Platform, and they were basically able to, to see what um, Chinese officials were doing in Xinjiang, and they were collecting all this data, and emerging technology like artificial intelligence and machine learning, it gives us the ability to gain insight from these massive pools of data that we didn't previously have before. Um, so basically data collection, that is the, the, would you say that's the greatest tool of, of autocrats? I th not just data collection, but the ability to do something with that data. When that data has value, uh, then that makes it, it useful. Um, if it's not useful, if people aren't actually labeling this data, then artificial intelligence can't do anything with it. So the ability to make the data useful for, and in this case, repressive ends, is what could tip the scales, I think, in favor of uh, repressive autocratic regimes. Let me first technology. go over here and then come, yep. come back to it after that. Marwan, you described what we were talking earlier about the situation in Lebanon mm -hmm. um, and how these um, surveillance techniques and, and other technologies are, are affecting what's going on. Can you give us something of a description? Of, of what that yes. Like. So, so Lebanon, uh, as of today, is on the 34th day of a popular uprising that's for the first time, for the very first time in the history of the country, at least for the modern history of the country, um, anti-sectarian, grassroots, uh, against corruption, against bread and butter issues as opposed to larger sort of ideology with a big eye um, issues. And the trigger was attacks that the government uh, wanted to impose on WhatsApp communication. Now, WhatsApp is not too popular, or is not very popular in the US, but in many parts of WhatsApp is, is owned by Facebook. Um, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's really a, a telecom app more than a, it's, it's right. not really a, for gaming or anything like that, but it's, a, it's very, very widely used. So when I'm in Lebanon, if I want to order a cab, I send a voice message through WhatsApp. Nobody writes, um, it's, you send pictures, you send voice. Um, there are entire businesses that can be, that are, reliant on WhatsApp, so it's a big deal, right? So this happened, uh, people are on the streets, um, they're burning tires, they're blocking roads, they're surrounding government institutions. Um, the problem is, within 24 hours, you had thousands of people on the streets. Within 48 hours, you had dozens of thousands. 
Um, and in, depending who you talk to, um, you have hundreds of thousands on the streets now on an intermittent basis. It has been 34 days after all. The problem with all of this, all of this was coordinated through the technology that the government was trying to pass. At the same time, what the protest movement seems unable to do is to mount um, an official political agenda that's positive, which is, as opposed, we want the government to be toppled, um, to say, this is what we want. You know, this is, this is, these are the laws that we want. This is the parliament that we want. And this has been a big problem. Um, so for example, there was a, a session of the parliament about to be held um, yesterday, and protesters managed to blockade the, the parliament. Uh, representatives could not make it to the parliament. Now, uh, this was trickier because they were also about to vote uh, an amnesty law that get, gets them off the hook for a lot of corruption. Uh, but what I'm talking about is a, is a state of, of political paralysis um, that is happening because these movements are decentralized, right. leaderless, um, and can't, uh, almost reluctant, not, not only incapable, but reluctant, even when they are capable, of designating leaders yeah. to negotiate to lead the charge. So you get massive numbers of people in the street and, and no one to lead the charge, no one yes. to, to direct their efforts. Of course, maybe they should just register for the ACLU. And then they can, they can so I, I do think that part of, you know, it, it, it's, it's not an either or, obviously, and part of the, um, the, the equation is to what extent there are institutions in place that, yeah. can, that can use the technology in right. Uh, right. organized forms of resistance. Yes. So the ACLU has been around for 100 years. We've been across the board civil liberties organization. You know, we've sued every president. So when, you know, when, when this president comes into power with, uh, as a sort of across the board threat to civil liberties and civil rights, people come to us. But they didn't just come to us. They came to the New York Times and the Washington Post that have never had higher subscription rates because people yeah. understand the importance of those institutions, institutions of civil society, uh, and one of the problems with the Middle East is that the, you know, the, a lot of the, there, there aren't the same kinds of civil society institutions that can take up the charge. So you know, the Arab Spring, yes, you know, Facebook and, uh, allowed people to come into the streets, but as you say, they didn't have the institutions to sort of respond. In a place where you have relatively robust civil society institutions, I think the, the costs and benefits are, 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 are quite different. But if I could just say yeah, one please, word yeah. about sort of the, you know, the to what extent technology is responsible for the rise of autocracy? You know, I think you know, no, no one can really know, right? These things are uh, obviously over-determined. But, but I would just throw out a few other possible possibilities. Grow, the growing gap between the haves and the have-nots around the world. Um, globalization, which is related to that. Migration, which is related to that. And technology itself, all of which create anxiety, right? An anxiety that I'm not getting what they're getting, anxiety that my jobs are leaving, anxiety that these people are coming in and they might be taking my job, anxiety that I can't figure out how to use my WhatsApp, right? All of these things are, uh, create anxiety, and when there's anxiety, people are, yeah. tend to favor strong leaders, whether it's an autocrat or whether it's a populist or whether it's an illiberal, you know, and, and, and you know, I think you see that in Donald Trump today. It's, it's that, that social anxiety. But I would not put it on, you know, social media and surveillance. I would put it on, you know, the failure of capitalism and liberalism to deal with the really rampant you know, uh, inequality that we well, have. Now, in now someone might argue, though, that the that the inequality itself, the growing inequality itself, is a product of technology. As people get, oh, yeah, yeah, they're, uh, all, as, they're related. Yeah. And, and right? The, do you want to say something? Well, like and, that? and the awareness of the inequality is exacerbated when everyone has access to information about how everybody yes, else is right, doing. Right? right. So, so which is a, a big factor, and that gets to a bigger point, which is. You, you, it's hard, really, and not usually right, to just talk about uh, technology qua technology as opposed to technology embedded in something else. Technology embedded in the phenomenon of inequality, right, or the awareness of inequality. So, for example, we talk about China, and you know they have a social credit score that they're right. sort of working on. And if you go to China today, depending on where you are, you're not going to use cash a lot. You're going to need a lot of electronic payments. And if your social credit score is too low, then you can't get train long, you know, train tickets, so you don't go to Beijing and start stir up protests and you, and that facial recognition, all these things. And some of these things are not inherently bad. 
the question is, if you live in a democracy that uses facial recognition, like ours does when DHS goes around and uses it at the Super Bowl to try to find somebody, at least you know, uh, or you should know in a democracy, what kind of information your government is collecting, mm -hmm. what, it, what purpose it does, with, uh, what it does with that, what law it's doing it pursuant to, and then how you can change the law if you don't agree with it or challenge it in court. In China, you have none of those factors in place, right? So you don't know what they're collecting. You don't know what they're doing with it. You can't challenge it in court because there's no independent court system. And you can't change the law because they don't have a democratic system. And that puts a completely different framework, even around some of the very same technologies. And, um, and I'll just add one thing to, to Marwan's very good point about the phenomenon of uh, how, and, and here I think the leader, the phenomenon of the leaderless uh, movement is actually highly technology driven because if you look at, I mean, look, look at the, 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 the movements were, that were changed governments or systems that we're familiar with going back to who led the Indian independence movement, Gandhi, who led the, you know, I don't know, Czechoslovakia with Vaclav Havel, who was in Poland, Vaclav you know, uh, who led, uh, you know, Kim Dae-jong in Korea, you can go on and on and on. Who led any of the protests in the Arab Spring? Name one. Nobody can name one. I mean, Egypt, the, the local guy who was working for Google guy, at, at the time sort of became the poster child. But there really wasn't a leader. I mean, it, it, people point to Joseph Wu in Hong Kong today, and he's a leader, but he's certainly not a leader of the violent sort of faction there. And so you get <laughs> leaderless movements that can have one, usually one, negative agenda. We're going to stop the gas price increase in Iran today. We are going to... Uh, show that we don't like Iranian influence in Iraq, which is stirring up a lot of the protests today. We're going to get Mubarak out of there in Egypt. We are going to, you know, whatever the thing is. Okay, but then you have the day after, and you have no leader, and you don't have a political agenda after that. And that's when you go from having pulled something down to a very difficult process of not being able to stand something back up to take its place. Okay, well, when, when you think, it's very interesting what you say, and I really want to connect it with um, the ACLU's litigation against the 215 metadata program, right? Because if we, if we think about um, the concentration of power as being related to the collection of data, right? Americans, and, and that, that in a sense we have greater tolerance for that uh, when we're afraid. Um, nevertheless, Americans were absolutely furious about the uh, metadata program. I was always puzzled why they were more furious about the metadata program than the um, incidental uh, substantive data collection program, which now we have um, uh, suspended, um, which may indeed be how the, uh, how the uh, Trump campaign was, was picked up, not as metadata, but as incidental data collection with uh, foreign targets. Nevertheless, the, the ACLU litigated against the metadata program because people were furious that, uh, that they were being surveilled, um, even with regard to just the, the metadata, the, the content, not the contents of their emails, but the direction, where it was going, when it was going, who it was coming from. Um, you know, to say something about whether or not Americans were right to be that worried about their privacy and whether or not, how can we keep up in a sort of information war with illiberal regimes uh, that have this incredible amount of uh, technology that they're willing to use to collect data of the sort. Maybe, David, you want to comment on that? You weren't, you weren't there when that litigation you know, happened. Yeah, but, but I, was, I was involved. I mean, I, you know, so, so for, for those of you who, uh, you know, who, who, for whom Section 215 is not, you know, does not uh, immediately come to mind, um, that was the program that the NSA ran that, co that essentially um, collected all the records of who you called, um, uh, how long you talked. And they, and they collected all for everybody, for everybody in this room, everybody in this country. Uh, and they got that because the phone companies keep that for billing purposes, basically. And then um, they would only access it where they had some uh, uh, reasonable suspicion that somebody might be a terrorist, and then they would access it to see whether there were links in that person's phone line that would either support or contravene the concern that the person might be a terrorist. But the problem with the program is it was adopted uh, entirely, a number of problems, it was adopted entirely in secret. 
presumably out of a concern that if it was made public, people would not accept it. Don't know whether that would have been true right after 9-11. They might, they were, will seem to be willing to accept every, anything after 9-11. But it then became public because of uh, Edward Snowden's disclosures. Uh, and, and that was significantly after 9-11 and at, at a time when people were a little less, um, you know, <coughs> caught by the fear of, uh, of terrorism. Uh, and studies uh, indicated that the program had never identified a single terrorist. Uh, and so then Americans started saying, well, why are you collecting all of my telephone data? Uh, you, know, you know, you know when I've texted my daughter that I'm going to be five minutes late picking her up at school, and when she texts me back and says, well, don't, you know, don't worry about it, I'll be right out, and then when I text her again because I've shown up at school and she hasn't come out, and then she texts me again and says, oh, I'll be right out, and then 20 minutes later I text her again and say, where are you? You know, all of that, right, that they have, they have all that, they don't have the content, they just have the exchanges, but you, know, you can get a lot from that. People say, well, I don't want to give up my privacy. Uh, in this way for a program that has no, shown no real uh, concrete benefits, at least if you count concrete benefits as finding actual terror. Yeah, but yeah, the irony, right, the irony is there we are giving away all of our personal data on Facebook and well, Twitter and, yeah. and Instagram. Well, and to the, and to the phone company, that's, right? That's I mean, this information wouldn't okay. be there if, it, if the phone company didn't have it already, right? So, but I, you know, uh, as, as we were talking earlier today, I, I do think there's a difference. I think most Americans feel there's a difference between uh, you know Verizon having that information and the and the federal government and the NSA having that right. information. Let me let Richard in on this. Yeah. So when the two fifteen stuff broke, I actually thought hard and tried to parse out specifically what is it? What is the difference? That so all our metadata, if you make a phone call, is collected and it is stored. It's and so the question was, is that stored in Verizon and AT and T servers, or is it stored in Verizon and AT and T servers? And the, and the government can go ask for it and query that under certain protocols. Or it's also stored in government servers, and the government can query that under certain protocols. So what's the difference, right? And, and the government protocols, at least that they came out, were specific and formal, and you can argue whether they're sufficient or not. But who the hell knows what the, the phone companies, I mean, you, you know, I, I, who knows? I mean, you could have an employee of the phone company looking at our stuff right now. We just don't know really what their protocols are for accessing that data. So what's the difference? And the sort of legal theory difference is, well, the coercive arm of the state is different than a company, right? So I don't worry that AT&T is going to launch a drone strike on my house, but if they are able to sort of, you know, put together my metadata in the right way, maybe they'll do that to me. And actually, I mean, that's theoretically the case. But actually, what I concluded after talking to a few people is something much more basic and visceral, which is people are creeped out by the idea of a, their government having too much of their personal information as opposed to Facebook, Google, uh, Verizon, AT&T. Right, well, and you know, so if you're driving, right? if you're driving and, and you know you've done nothing wrong, but there's a police car behind you, you start to feel nervous, right? Maybe I did do something wrong that I'm not even aware of. Maybe he's going to get me. If there's an Amazon delivery truck behind you that may, if you looked it up, know more about you, you don't feel nervous. It's just a different Look, feeling. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I, I agree 100%. But here's, here's, here's my issue, right? Whether it's the Pentagon or Verizon, chances are that metadata is stored on an Amazon cloud, right? That, that's, where, that's, that's where most of, of the data is. And so I do worry about sort of single access points. Of course, it's extremely difficult to violate it, to hack it, all that stuff. But if it's done, then everything is out in the open. That, that's one thing. The other thing is, you know, what I, what I, I mean, I used to be creeped out when I look at a shirt online and it keeps following me for three months, right? If I'm reading the New York Times, the shirt appears. Now, now there's something else. You know, last week I was at a, at a reception and we were talking, uh, we were arguing about, you know, Pinot Noir and all that. And my phone was next to me and then I opened my Twitter feed and I, I was having wine brands being pushed at me on Twitter, right? And so, so the extent of, um, um, transparency. We use transparency as a positive word all the time. Transparency is an autocrat's wet dream. Full transparency, full transparency is the very worst thing that can happen to us. You know, we, we have, now you go through airports that, where your temperature is measured, um, your iris is scanned in some cases, in, in some parts of the world, your fingerprints are taken. Uh, we have many governments all over the world moving to biometric identification systems, from India to Sierra Leone to, you know, a, a lot of places. We have, um, there's one of the most troublesome but interesting areas of research in my field now, 
uh, is what all voice recognition technologies do, so including Alexa. Now, Alexa can tell from your voice that you may have the flu or that you may have the beginning of something that would become the flu, and that, that metadata is collected, right? right? So we're talking about a device in your home, and, I'm not, and I don't have Alexa, neither do I believe in, in, in the rants, the conspiratorial rants, but it's something to be considered, right? When you have devices all over the place connected to your thermostat, to your cell phone, to your, perhaps to your GPS in your car, as, as you said earlier, somebody who connects all these dots knows everything there's ever to know about you, knows more than your, than your intimate partner, knows more than your doctor, knows more than your employer combined. So I want to get to Kara here, and, and let's turn to the subject of, of the responsibility of big data <coughs> companies, because this is a really critical um, topic here. We can talk about their responsibility for protecting our privacy, um, as well as their responsibility for the um, tendency to which they may be assisting the growth of, of autocratic regimes. Um, sort of putting on your Facebook hat for the moment, uh, Kara. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference between sort of Facebook's approach and, and say, Google or, or Twitter, which there are a variety of different self-policing approaches that these companies are taking? Yeah, and I don't want to speak for Facebook. I don't work for Facebook anymore. I work for Richard. Um, so, <laughs> um, um, but so I'll, I can talk a little bit about generally um, big tech and sort of build off my testimony in the Senate a few weeks ago as well, where um, I, I was sort of like, okay, we need to enshrine these data protections into uh, and clearly articulate specific policies around protecting these specific kinds of data, especially biometric data, as we've talked about. Sometimes other classifications are warranted, like sensitive data, and additional protections should surround them. Um, that makes sense. Um, but, but it is true. I mean, by some estimates, uh, by 2030, 500 billion devices are going to be connected to the internet. And whoever can control that power is going to have, or that all of, all of those devices, um, if they can, and data collection capabilities and whatnot, um, they're going to have inordinate power. And um, to be able to process that information and exploit that information, which we are able to do now, and, and that was my other point, the, the capabilities that these tech companies have, because they've been collecting data for so long, sometimes without our knowledge, um, the IBM Flickr scandal, I, I think it merits um, repeating, where uh, IBM had actually been using photos uh, to develop their facial recognition algorithms um, based off of um, basically grabbing them from Flickr without people noticing. So you upload things on, on Flickr and all of a sudden you're being used to help a facial recognition algorithm become more accurate and have less false positives and whatnot. So some people's faces in this room could potentially have been used um, to, to do that kind of thing. Um, and I think the American public is wising up. There's sort of um, Pew research polls repeatedly on facial recognition that say um, that they trust, that the American people trust law enforcement to use facial recognition responsibly more so than they do companies and um, advertising companies as well, um, so corporations. So in, in your testimony before the House Subcommittee on uh, Senate uh, Judiciary, oh, Senate Judiciary, Senate Judiciary, okay. Um, uh, what are the range of options that we can imagine uh, we might adopt to, to protect personal data and particularly the uses of those data? Yeah, and I think it's really important to demonstrate what right looks like. And, um, and that is, you know, making sure that um, some, I guess, options like a national privacy uh, regulation has been thrown out there. But I think we need to start from um, consent, notice and consent is not to be the exception, but it should be the rule. Um, that doesn't even happen now. There's, everyone has probably heard about the right to opt in or the right to opt out, that kind of thing. We should at least have a right to opt in. Uh, in the negotiation between privacy con and convenience, a lot of Americans, myself included at times, choose convenience over privacy, but just that little check, um, in technical terms, we would have versions Locked of that. Locked into having your data given away to third parties, that, as opposed that to well. opting out. Exactly. I, that's the third party data sharing, I think, is a critical um, portion of it, because right now, um, a lot of companies aren't required to disclose whether or not they are sharing the data they collect with third parties. Um, that, it came up with uh, regard to uh, Google and uh, the commercial use of healthcare data when they worked with the essential healthcare system. Um, so the, the fact that these, a lot of these people who had went in, the, in over 21 states 
um, to visit Ascension uh, facilities potentially had their data accessed by 150 Google employees is something they, if they had that check, if they had that knowledge that that was actually happening, then they may have been able to choose whether or not to share the data with Google. But it looks like right now that that's legal under HIPAA regulations from 1996. So I think we need to, we need to realize what the digital environment looks like. We need to realize what the capabilities are and private tech companies have in some cases, vastly superior capabilities than, than we ever did in the intelligence community in terms of yes, their expertise, right, their right. crafting, their engineering. Um, so we need to sort of um, recalibrate the rules of the road um, and define them more clearly now for a digital age that is growing more complex and, and more sophisticated. So when you think about the difference between Google and Facebook's approach to disinformation and content, so Google has is rolling out a uh, a new uh, sort of content test uh, that will first come out in the UK uh, and that will try to filter disinformation, at least reduce the amount of disinformation. Uh, Facebook has refused to do that. It's taken the position that they should, they should not have to do that. Um, really, uh, anyone, maybe Marwan, you want to answer this. Um, what can we say about those different approaches? This is self-regulation. Self uh, will, you know, is Google going in the right direction? And, um, and is this uh, something we expect Facebook will catch up with? Or, or is sort of, you know, the more First Amendment side of, of Facebook's stance going to win out in the end? So, so Google's, Google's strategy will be as good as their algorithms are to ferret out the right kind of disinformation, right? right? I mean, we've mentioned the classic sort of uh, breast cancer and pornography. That, and you have a lot of these uh, kinds of information where good, important information, whether for public health or with educational value, gets taken out, um, and then you have to follow up. So, so, it's, so again, what's the default mode? Right is, 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 is a big question. Uh, Facebook seems to have decided that it's growth at any cost. It's adding, um, um, adding people to Facebook um, as, as fast, as many as possible, uh, without looking at what this is causing. I mean, there's, you know, in my field, there are, there are, it's very well documented that uh, in some ways, um, if you want a tool to um, to manipulate people to vote for the wrong candidates, to give people misinformation, to send them to the wrong polling place. You couldn't invent better than Facebook. We've seen it in Myanmar, we've seen, we've seen it all over the world, right? But I think there's something else we don't, we don't think about very often, that these are global companies, right? So if you're in Europe, for example, um, and you're trying to access some of these uh, websites, um, um, in some cases, even if you're trying to access some um, US newspaper sites, you can't access them because they don't follow, they don't follow the, uh, what is it, GDPR, right? The, 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 the European Consumer Data Protection Regulation. So, so there, there are regulations that could work, right, in, in that sense. And I don't, I'm not sure that self-regulation here is the best way. Because Facebook has shown that um, it's just going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Um, They're not going to self-regulate. I, I don't believe so. So now, David, I mean, from the First Amendment standpoint, you know, um, the ACLU has been as strong as any uh, U.S. Uh, organization or, or interest group in, in defending First Amendment rights. Um, but yet we see the, the pushback in Europe um, around some of the disinformation and the security threats uh, it are solutions that we could not adopt. Uh, because yeah. of our First Amendment tradition. Um, where do you stand on that, and do you think, uh, therefore, self-regulation is the way to go, or can we impose well, I, I regulation? Well, I, I think, I think it's, it's, it's much more, obviously, much more difficult um, to have state-mandated um, you know, state mandated content moderation, highly dubious proposition under uh, the First Amendment. So, um, so you, know, you, you may have self-regulation or nothing um, uh, in the United States, uh, with respect to content, but just just a word about what the, the, the sort of differences between what Twitter, Google, and Facebook have yes. done. The, the, the common problem is targeted political advertising. Yes. That's the common problem, and the reason that's a problem is because ordinarily we rely on the marketplace of ideas and we rely on counter speech to um, correct errors, uh, you know, bring truth to light, uh, counter. Uh, false narratives and the like. But if you have targeted political advertising where you are allowed to micro-target your message to people who are very inclined to believe it already 
and not inclined to challenge it, or, or and nobody else sees it, then where does the counter speech come in? Yes. So what Google? So 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 that's the problem. That problem, by the way, arises from data collection because it's only because of data collection and aggregation that you, that 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 these companies know who you are, what and what kind, you know, how to micro-target. But but what? But they've, so they've all done something different. Twitter has said, given these problems, we're just not going to allow targeting political advertising, period. We're just not going to take political how advertising. Can they be, how do they know that they can avoid it? They're just not taking political advertising. They're not well, they're any political, taking, yeah, any political advertising. Okay. And, then, and, then, and so that gets them out of having to draw distinctions between false and, and, and true, but it reduces the ability of people to use that valuable tool to reach, to, to spread their message. That that's that's comes at some cost. Facebook has said, we're going to presume that what political candidates say um, is of public interest, whether it's true or false, and it's just impossible to distinguish between what's true or false in most instances. So we're not going to engage in that um, effort, and we'll hope that the uh, system uh, can, can correct, but the system can't correct with um, targeted advertising. They're already getting pushback. They're already, I think, modifying some of those positions. Um, things like false information that a polling booth is over here when it's over here, or that the election day is on Wednesday, not Tuesday, right? They're going to take that then. Um, or, which we saw a lot of, um, suppression of minority votes yes. by saying you can vote from home, yeah. next to, right? Right, right, right. So, no, so no, things that would, but then here's what, what Google has done is something different. They've said we're going to limit targeted political advertising. And that may be the best route. So what they've said is you can't micro-target. You can, you, can, you can target using only these three things, age, gender, and, um, and, and zip code, which, you know, that's still targeting, but it's, it's, it's the, not the kind of targeting that's going to ensure that a message will not get to anybody who might challenge it. I mean, you send a message to a zip code that's mostly white, mostly affluent, there are going to be some people in that zip code who are going to object to the message and are going to raise concerns. So that's... But David, that's, brief answer, and then I, I want to get Richard in on this. Could Congress mandate that kind of filtering if the companies don't do it themselves? So, uh, you know, I, I think if, 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 if Congress tar um, passed a law that limited targeted political advertising, that being, that's the real problem. If they passed a law that limited targeted political advertising, it would be highly um, likely to be struck down by the Supreme Court because it singles out speech on the basis of its content, political, not, it's not singling out other advertising, just political advertising, and it is um, limiting only that speech. And so you have to have a compelling state interest. You have to uh, satisfy strict scrutiny. You have to show this is the only way to deal with the problem. Now, it is possible that over time, the costs of this practice, which are that you can no longer have a democratic deliberative process because you know, this side of the room is not hearing what that side of the room is, is hearing, and vice versa. That, the, that First Amendment jurisprudence might change, but under current First Amendment jurisprudence, very different. What, what do you think, Richard? Is this, uh, this kind of regulation thinkable in our current legal and political landscape? No, not at all. Um, just not to put too fine a point on it, but let me look at the impeachment hearing today. So you want to ban disinformation. So if you said uh, a piece of disinformation is that the Ukrainians, not the Russians, interfered in the 2016 election, and you ask the members of the House Intelligence Committee, committee who are the con congressional members who would have to legislate on any of this, some Republicans would say that's not disinformation, and some Democrats would say it is disinformation. So a lot of, you know, the easy stuff is voting day is Wednesday, it's actually Tuesday, or this is a blue horse instead of a table. But what we're really talking about is stuff that, you know, is credible enough to throw people off the scent to make yep. them think and believe something that they would otherwise not believe, but not so obviously wrong. I mean, the obviously wrong stuff can be a problem, but that's kind of the easy stuff. And I just don't see how you would, I mean, all, all and even on the targeting, I mean, all political um, speech is targeted, or advertising is targeted, right? I mean, the billboard is in one place right. rather than another, the commercial's on one channel rather than the other, the, you know. So the, then you're arguing over what are the, what, what sort of legitimate targeting versus illegitimate targeting, and as a legal matter, I don't know that there's anyone who could make that distinction and if in it's law. Foreign source, and what if it's foreign sourced? Right. Not so what I, so what, I, what, I, what I would say is, if there's a solution to this stuff, 
if. I think domestically, it's the development of political shaming using crappy, untrue sources. Now, whether we will ever get there, people will just choose to believe what they believe. Maybe it's a, it's a lost cause. But, you know, I mean, part of the 2016 thing, had, had the Russian disinformation been confined to the online space, it would not have been nearly as effective as when the major Republican presidential candidate stood up and read stuff from RT and, and inserted it, and then it became a mainstream media thing. And there was no political cost associated with that, but if there was, that would be a different calculation. On the foreign side, I think that as a foreign policy matter, and this is true of disinformation, but all the other forms of technology being used by autocracies to meddle in democracies, we're an open society. These are open platforms that we're talking about. We're not going to be able to draw a perimeter around ourselves and say that this is all off limits to the Russians and the Irans and the North Koreas and the Chinas. You have to, you have to impose a cost on them when it's coming from their governments in order to get them to stop doing this kind of thing, or at least reduce it, right? So, I mean, in, in our country, based on the oper intelligence operation conducted by Vladimir Putin's folks in 2016, our country to this day is in turmoil. This is the definition of a low-cost, high-benefit sort of yep. operation. Yep. Any human activity, low-cost, high-benefits, what's the lesson? Repeat. Yeah. So the only way you do that is reduce the benefits and increase the cost. It's really hard sometimes to reduce the benefits when we're talking about this stuff because of the open nature of our society, because of our First Amendment, because people have different opinions about what's true and what's not, and you just, that's kind of how it is right now. Um, but you can certainly increase the cost. And we have a whole NATO alliance designed to impose costs if Russia ever moves across into the Baltics with a tank column. But what's likelier? They'll do that, or they'll meddle in the 2020 election. This is a major national security threat to the United States. Right. So well, how would you increase the costs? Well, there's a whole variety of, I mean, you, you could do off, I mean, and there's some things that have been done. I mean, on election day in, um, in 2018, the Internet Research Agency in Moscow that was doing this came, reportedly, came to work and, and didn't have access to the Internet that day. All their computers were shut off. They also had messages sent to, to certain people saying, who were hack, patriotic hackers and stuff, saying, we know what you're doing, your chance now is to stop, and if you don't stop, we will take additional consequences against, you know, online consequences. So, I mean, there's sanctions, there's offensive cyber operations, there's, I mean, there, there's a, the, the sort of standard toolkit of, of things, both on the overt and the covert side, um, that you can do to impose costs. Part of this- Democracy's toolkit. Exactly. Well, right, and that's- That's gonna have to be the follow-on Wall Street right. Journal Democracy's thing. I'm just, toolkit, you know, that's exactly right. Um, but but what, what I would say, one, one issue we're having right now is if a Russian tank column was looked like it was about to come over into the Baltics. Uh, there would be a meeting of the North Atlantic Council in two seconds, and NATO's got all these protocols for how to deal with this. We deal with this as an international problem that is, you know, we're all, all for one, one for all. But when China has meddled through technological means in the Australian democratic system, it was an Australian problem. Mm -hmm. 2016, American problem. America responded to the, the degree it did unilaterally. No, NATO knows it. When in France, when Russia hacked the French elections, it was a French problem. We are not thinking about this as a national security problem that is, con that is dealt with um, together and faced together by the democratic powers of the world that have a common interest in getting the autocratic countries in the world to cut this stuff out. No. All right, so I want to I go to audience questions, but just before we do that, I have one last topic I want to cover, and then we're going to open it up for discussion, uh, and that is education. Um, so far, the, the discussion is gloomy, right? Um, uh, autocrats have this incredible toolkit. Uh, we're moving ever more in the direction of, of concentrating power in the hands of autocrats, and there's not much we can do about it. Um, we can't regulate speech because of our First Amendment. Uh, tech companies only to a very limited extent want to do it themselves. Uh, here we're coming up on the 2020 election. It's going to happen again, right? So we're kind of stuck. Um, where do we go from here? Um, my kids came home one day from school and um, in the run-up to the 2016 election and told me they're so disappointed. They just learned that Hillary Clinton is running a sex ring out of the back of a pizza joint, and they're really shocked that she would do something like that. I said, why would you think that was true? They said, we have friends who saw it on the Internet. But they didn't see it themselves, but, and of course, whatever appears on the Internet is true. Now, we've all moved up the, the learning curve to some extent on that, um, but it's only going to 
because um, uh, foreign countries and, and indeed those who want to spew disinformation within this country to get more sophisticated about the way that they influence our, our children uh, as well as our adults, but, it, but particularly children are more uh, subject to this because they get all of their information off the internet. In fact, they hardly turn their phones off long enough to, to even listen to, to us, right? Um, let alone go to a book or, or some other source of, of information. Um, how do we address this in the long run? I don't know whether we're going to be able to um, engage in enough work on the security side to have an impact on the 2020 election, to adopt sufficient countermeasures to, to make sure our elections are secure. But in the long run, there's got to be a solution which has more to do with education than with regulation, I'm guessing. Absolutely. So, so what I tell my students always, I use a pre-paper metaphor to explain what digital literacy or literacy in general, political literacy, cultural literacy should be in the digital age. And that's to think of Plato's cave. And I tell them, we live in Plato's digital cave, right? Plato's cave. A man is chained in front of a wall, um, there's a fire, he sees, he sees shadows from the street, mistakes them for reality. And what you need to, to do and teach are how do you authenticate narratives? How do you verify evidence yourself? How do you weigh and value different sources of evidence? And I'm afraid the answer is going to sound uh, very cliché, but I do believe that the best antidote to what we're going through is to reinvigorate liberal arts education. Um, you know, how, the nature of evidence. Sometimes I find myself having conversations about the nature of evidence. What constitutes real evidence, right? Um, and a lot of our students seem to be confused about that. Uh, they absolutely are. And what's the, what's the solution? I mean, that is, we, we're not going to get the internet out of our lives. And so long as it's there, it seems that it will be a constant source of, of disinformation or, um, or just um, sort of lack of context even for sort of true information. Right. Um, so, so how do we, I mean, we're really talking about retooling the human mind and the way that human beings learn because they have to now approach um, every source of public information with a heavy dose of skepticism. And where are they supposed to stand to base that skepticism on? Well, maybe. I don't know if we have to rewire human nature necessarily. I mean, my, my, so my Hillary Clinton, you know, sex ring uh, anecdote with my kids is, I don't know if the killer clown phenomenon was a thing in Philadelphia a few oh, years ago, but, you know, my kids were in elementary school and there was this rumor going around, uh, mostly spread on the internet and then it became word of mouth and all this, that they were outside the elementary school, including the one that my kids went to, supposedly there were killer clowns hiding in the woods. There weren't even really woods outside, but, you know, whatever, <laughs> details. And, and that they were stealing kids who came, you know, and all that. And my kids were actually scared of this. I mean, you could see they were scared. And so the Washington Post did a long story talking about the origin of this myth and debunking it and all this other stuff. So I showed it to my oldest daughter. And she said, well, you got one website that says that it's not true, but I've got two that says it's true, right? Or 10, I mean, course. everybody right. has, like, you know, friends or, like, uncles that you trust less and that you trust more, right? There are more authoritative sources of information and there are less authoritative sources of information. There are ones that try to get it right and when they get it wrong, correct themselves. And there's others that are fonts of misinformation, yes. right? Now, part of the problem, to state the obvious now, is that the, some of those more authoritative sources of information are being labeled as not authoritative, including by our political leaders. Got it, understand. But as an as a educational matter with kids, just like you teach them, like, you know, Uncle Ernie, you got to sort of apply the 50% discount to what he says, but, you know, when Aunt, you know, whoever says something, you know, she's probably telling it the right way, they're going to have to distinguish between different sources of information online. And, you know, there, there is something to authoritativeness uh, when it comes to this stuff that is part of that process. All right. So can I just throw out one other? I mean, I think, you know, education, sure. Is it going to solve the problem? No. Um, re some regulation necessary. But one idea that was, um, that was proposed at a recent uh, conference I attended on the same subject was um, the development of a system of ethics for these platforms. And the, 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 the idea was sort of they, they analogized to journalism, where there was, you know, go back and, and yellow dog journalism. It was that people were saying anything they wanted to and, uh, and lying, you know, fake news was, the, was what, what we had. And it was fake news on one side and fake news on the other side. Not that different from MSNBC and Fox News, but um, uh, what worse. And 
People got sick and tired of it at some point, and the journalistic industry realized that they had to develop a sense of a, a set of journalistic ethics that we now know about objective <laughs> journalism and checking your facts and uh, and the and, like. And unfortunately, it hasn't worked all that well. Well, it's, so. but it's worked. It's, 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 I think it's I think it's done. I think it's done something, and I think it's it's a it's a form of self regulation, particularly in an area where where law. Uh, is is likely to be limited, um, you know, and and I think we we are very much at the beginning of this whole, um, you know, social media phenomenon, and so you know, it, 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 these platforms are struggling with what's the right way to do it, and what's the way to do it that maintains our profitability but also our legitimacy, and I think a, 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 a an ethical system of ethics may be an appropriate. Thing. Even so when again, you, it's not a solution, right. but it's part and, even, of it. and even when you've had that, so go back. 25 years to the height of the authoritative local paper and the four network channels that had, you know, the morning news and the evening news and all this other kind of stuff, right? Even then, if you took your kid, or you were a kid, going to the candy aisle before the checkout, there was Weekly World News, the black and yes. white tabloid that said Tom Hanks is secretly an alien and all this other just crazy stuff. And people might have been entertained, but and maybe in some were a few people, yeah. crazed people believed it. But most people didn't believe it. It looked like a newspaper. It was written like a newspaper. Yep. But it was totally untrue. Why did people not believe it? Because they learned to distinguish between authoritative sources of information and less authoritative sources of information. And because we're at the beginning of this stuff, um, and because I think kids are trying to sort this out, and all, you know, and, and it's such a mess, um, we've got to make progress on that dimension. All right, let's get our audience into the conversation. Uh, we have two microphone holders who will bring the microphone to you. Um, so just raise your hand. We'll get, I'd like to get two going at once so we can be um, fast uh, in going from one question to another. And let's keep our questions reasonably brief so we can get through as many as possible. So sir, and let's, here's someone else. Let's put a, a second mic in someone else's hand. Do you have a second mic? So here's someone else. Yeah. Okay. The, the latter part of this conversation sort of got away from what the topic was up here. And we're talking about what can a democracy do to protect its own citizens from becoming an authoritative data collection mechanism. But the real question should be, how does a democracy protect itself from China and that kind of a government? I was recently in China, and I think the gentleman here alluded to it. You can't do anything there because it's a cashless society. When I wanted to make a phone call, I had to find some kids. And I said, I'll give you the money if you'll make the phone call for me to, to make the contact. And it's getting worse and worse. And the biggest weapon that they have over there is that they're able to literally disconnect an individual from the whole environment. And that his credit card doesn't work. They recognize him with the computer, that they know who it is. Right? He finds that his electric door lock dick doesn't work anymore. That's the real problem, in that it appears that the authoritative governments have a significant advantage in the international environment because they can do that, and we're not willing to let our government do that. Kara, do you want to say that? That's interesting. I think there are a couple dimensions to that. Um, with regard to the China thing, I think the best way to prevent um, our American data's exploitation by that kind of thing is to acknowledge where this data, or figure out where the data is stored. Right now, because of the murky relationship between Chinese private tech companies and Beijing, uh, we don't necessarily know if the national intelligence law is being implemented, if these service providers, it, it basically compels service providers to provide data if uh, the, the central government asks. Um, we, we don't know how, it, they're written in sweeping terms, they're written very broadly. Um, and I think you have to, to, Americans have to know that if their, if any of their data is stored on servers or, um, you know, owned or stored on places owned by Chinese companies, that potentially they are subject to the national intelligence law. They are subject to the cybersecurity law and various permutations and updates to it um, that, that will compel these private organizations to give Beijing their data. Um, there's been vociferous protests on behalf of these company CEOs saying they will, you know, we will never, I'll 
I'll look them straight in the shooting thing, straight in the eye, and, and not give them the data. But uh, come on, do they really have the recourse? Uh, do they have the independent judiciary we were talking about before to contest that, like we do in America? Uh, do they have an engaged citizenry and civil society to contest that as well? Um, no, these there's a big difference between the bulwarks we have here and what they don't have in China, as Richard was talking about before. So we, we need to understand that just because we are using things that maybe um, uh, used in America, that this pot potential does exist. We need to pay attention to where our data is going and know that that is, you know, sort of a possible um, a thing that can happen. And that I think is the first step. And then we start we need to to write policies in full recognition that that is the idea and act accordingly. And, and no, no, see, no, Carrie, you, you might. Missed my point. My point. Is, hey, look at today. Well, you, in Kashmir, where the Indian government has completely shut down the internet, right? And in Iran, they've completely shut down the internet to, to avoid any action by their population. And what I'm saying, what do we do to, to protect ourselves from them, not protecting ourselves from our own government? But they're not shutting down our internet, right? So the question is, do we, do we start to regard these actions on the part of other governments towards their own citizenry as some kind of human rights abuse? Does our conception of, of human rights start to evolve to, to include, to encompass um, what governments do technologically to their citizens? So, um, yeah, I just wanted to actually bounce off that point because they are shutting us down. And that's something that hasn't been discussed yet because we, you guys have talked a lot about, oh, what happens if Russia or China or some autocratic nation tries to push in to our informational structure, misinformation, okay? But what about in the last couple of months, there have been a lot of news stories that China is, is a big marketplace, right? And a lot of American companies want to get into that market. So now we are seeing American companies beginning to censor information in America. So when a high level executive in the NBA made some comments sympathetic to the people in Hong Kong and the democracy movement there, all of a sudden you see the NBA do a complete backstab. Oh, that's inappropriate. You know, that shouldn't happen. Disney is falling over itself to censor its own content to make sure that the Chinese market will allow their movies and products to be shown there. So that's the real threat, is their marketplace is controlling our freedoms here in the United States to be able to save that's, that's a great point. Maybe um, so just one um, So that's what I was talking about with regard to the value flow, right? We're importing some of their values, which include censorship, and we're not exporting what we need to, um, which is freedom, transparency, openness, et cetera. Um, there is activity and energy on the Hill right now looking at these specific issues. Marco Rubio wrote a strongly worded letter to the President of the United States asking for the enforcement of anti boycott laws uh, that were created in the 70s. And he specifically singled out Tencent, Alibaba, you know, these big Chinese startups. These national champions um, and said, we, if they are going to boycott what we are trying to do in their country, then we are going to have to enforce our anti-boycott laws. So there is, we are talking, or people on the Hill are talking about this. Um, there is energy behind it right now, but we, we basically have to make it effective. Richard, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, it's hard because a media company, for example, or an entertainment company, and the NBA is an entertainment company, will say, well, the biggest entertainment market in the world now is China. And, you know, we can pretty easily calculate what the negative consequences are going to be if we let a random tweet by the general manager of the Houston Rockets stand. And yes, maybe we anger some people in the United States. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're about shareholder value. And that's what's going to, the profit margin is going to drive where we come down on these kinds of things. So if that is roughly the case, then until the profit motive points in a different direction, uh, then you're not, I don't think you will see much change. I mean, it's not a coincidence that no major uh, movie studio will release a movie where China's the villain now, even though during the Cold War, the Soviet Union was always the villain, right? And, and all this other stuff. And now North Korea might be the villain or Iran might be the villain, but you know, nobody, it's China because they want to market those movies in, in China, right? And so, um, and they won't be able to do that if China looks like it's coming out bad. Um, so I think the economics of that aren't 
likely to go away anytime soon. The, the question is whether that creates an even greater backlash in the non-China parts of their market that outweigh the perceived benefits. So, you know, I mean, the, the backlash against the NBA was pretty big. Um, but are fewer people going to go to NBA games in the United States? Probably not. Maybe. I don't know. But probably not. And if not, then, you know, from a purely economic as opposed to an ethical uh, and, and political calculation, they kind of made the right decision, right? And so um, I, I don't think there's, a, there's an easy or, or sort of straightforward solution to, to that. Let's get some more questions, and there's one right here. Yeah, I, I think we can agree that there are separate issues around, you know, the concentrations of private power um, with technology and the, the role of the big tech companies, and then the issues of what governments can do and I would like to shift the discussion to governments and what governments can do on all sides um, and raise the, the, um, the topic, which we haven't discussed, of cyber warfare. The, the general counsel of, uh, of Microsoft has asked us all to consider the possibility of having a new uh, chapter to the Geneva Convention, which would prevent the uh, illegitimate use by governments of techniques of war that would harm civilian um, populations. And, and you could imagine <clears throat> with the Internet of Things, you know, the ability of governments to shut down power systems, to rob um, the ability of, of uh, infrastructure to operate, um, shut down port facilities, shut down media, uh, spread panic. Um, you were alluding, sir, to the, the, what the U.S. had done to Russia, and uh, there certainly have been cyber attacks against Iran. What do we think about the new, um, the possibility of the governments of the world getting together and say, hey, look, you know, um, techniques of war have civilian consequences, let's limit them, um, and let's set a new set of uh, ethics and a rule of law around what are legitimate tactics of governments in conducting warfare against each other. But, but almost certainly these techniques are going to be more of the hacking variety than of the propaganda variety, but yeah, it's a, wouldn't you it's say? A slightly different focus, yeah. but I think uh, it, it is a big issue around um, technology and whether technology can be used to, uh, to flout political institutions, to put pressure externally on governments um, of whatever variety, whether we call them democratic or we call them authoritarian. Um, clearly, um, you know, the people on the receiving end are going to perceive their own institutions differently than we do um, and query whether, you know, breaking things down into these neat value boxes isn't really getting at what's, what's truly going on, which is the government is beginning to take back power from the marketplace uh, and weaponize um, what had not been weaponized previously. <coughs> I, I mean, I'll just take a bit, very quickly. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm broadly familiar with the Microsoft uh, Digital Geneva Convention I, uh, notion. Um, I, I start from a position of some skepticism about distinguishing distinguishing between digital acts and digital effects and everything else. Right. So either it's legitimate under the law of armed conflict to blockade a coast or use cyber means to shut down a port, or it's not, right? You're, I mean, that's an act of war. Well, I'm sitting next to an expert in the law of armed conflict. I have to be really careful. But I believe it's the case that a blockade is seen as an act of war. Um, it's, it's a use of force. There we go. So it's a use of force, right? So, so if you have the same effect through digital means, it would seem to me that we'll both be inter largely interpreted by the, by the country in question um, the same way and, and, and could sort of be legally. I, I just think it's very hard to say we will all agree not to um, hack SCADA systems and shut down critical infrastructure, but if we're really at war, we can bomb it um, because we haven't agreed not to do that, right? Um, because then that just sort of pushes you, which of course, even the bombs now are, have a digital component to them. So I, 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 I don't know conceptually how you segregate the digital aspects of, of these acts and their effects from the non-digital aspects as opposed to is there a broader class of activities or effects that we want to not do or protect, whether it's through digital or analog or kinetic means. I mean, I would just but answer you, but yeah, I, I, I would I just answer you by saying that, that um, this is really more of um, a piece of, of um, show than it is a serious proposition. Um, 
<clears throat> we don't need to add anything to the Geneva Conventions um, that talk about impacting uh, civilians because, of course, our existing international law already addresses um, uh, harm to civilians under the uh, concepts of distinction. Um, now, it is true that the problem with, with um, cyber attacks is that it is very, very difficult to engage in distinction. So if we're going to use cyber offensively um, as uh, a form of um, a force in war, uh, how are we going to um, achieve distinction? But there's, there's um, no reason to treat it any differently than other kinds of weapons. The trouble is that what may be impacting our democracy more than actual cyber attacks is the use of propaganda. And there's no way you're going to get that under the law of war. This is not an act of war to release propaganda. We ourselves have a long history leafleting countries where we want to um, win hearts and minds. The use of Facebook and Twitter um, and, and other social media platforms to try to win hearts and minds in the, in, in the advance of the 2016 election is not an act of war. Unfortunately, right? So, so war may not be the most dangerous thing to our democracy, as it turns out. Other question? Yes. Which, which if, if any, of the candidates in 2020 on either side are saying the right things about technology and the threats to democracy? Wow, that's a great question. Tara, you want to? No, um, do I have to admit that I didn't watch the debates last night then? Uh, but I did see that um, people are actually mentioning emerging technology and artificial intelligence. So um, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to name a specific candidate as being recorded. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about it. Anybody else? No, the, the, this is a cop-out, but the ACLU doesn't endorse or oppose any <laughs> candidate for <laughs> political office. No, I mean, to, to ask a follow-up question on that, do you think that uh, the role of technology has adequately entered our um, political consciousness, and, and should it be more of an issue um, in uh, the upcoming presidential elections than it currently is? Gotcha. I mean, I think, it's, I think it's, it's definitely part of the, right, the, the entire Mueller investigation was about that right. problem. Uh, we, have a, we have an administration that is, you know, uh, has a self-interest in being blind to the problem, but um, but I think that you know at least half the country is concerned about it. And and part of the problem is, of course, um, we're debating technology, but the real issue there is foreign influence. Yeah. And 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 those issues um, cut at right angles, right? Because we have all sorts of um, again voter, voter suppression and and disinformation right here in this country. Um, so. It's more the issue of foreign influence that may be yeah. entering those um, debates. Yeah, so, so a couple of things about this. One of the things that, that troubles me about how <coughs> these things are explained publicly. So look at AI, for example. Um, uh, unless you're reading um, some of the more authoritative sources, um, you get narratives about basically the machines are taking over or that this is only for the you get you get the 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 twenty percent or the ten percent on a spectrum of a hundred percent that are the, the poles you get the extreme narratives that tend to dominate you don't get the kind of measured debate about uh, have you seen in a newspaper a really good blow by blow explanation of how artificial in intelligence is changing labor markets right. I haven't seen that in the Wall Street Journal for example but I've seen a lot of basically fear mongering on cable TV about what it's going to do, and, right. and you know, so so a, a short video about from a cable channel about AI taking over manufacturing jobs, micro-targeted in a place like Milwaukee, can wreak havoc in an election um, by by again feeding the anxieties that David was talking about, and we don't have a place, an authoritative source of information where these things are explained in accessible language to citizens who may not have the time to read, you know, academic journal articles about AI, let alone the Wall Street Journal or the so New York Times. So what you're really suggesting, if, if the internet can wreak so much havoc, then why can't it do as much good? Right? Why can't it be part of the force by which we actually um, gain information, educate our citizens? Because it, it doesn't sell, right? McNeil Lehrer, no I don't think it's still called no. McNeil Lehrer, but McNeil Lehrer, right, they, they try to do this. and and, and how many people watch McNeil Air versus how many, probably in this room, a fair number, but uh, versus how many people watch Fox News and MSNBC, which are just, you know, sort of the 
the polar opposites, and, and, and but I would say welcome to democracy. I mean, I yeah. just, this, is, this is. We got a question up here. Uh, Mr. Crady, if you can stand up, it'll be easier for us to hear. Mr. Crady and Mr. Fontaine both mentioned how activism, in the context of activism and revolution, it is currently easier to pull down governments and to oppose a particular issue than it is to create something and to have constructive governance. I was wondering if you could appraise the outlook for um, technology to create something, either through the ability to hold snap elections and prevent power vacuums, or for a social network to provide a mediated forum for creating um, the ideas of a diverse group. Well, I can, I can reiterate the notion that you know, technology on its own doesn't do anything. But the speed factor that you mentioned, what I worry about, a snap election, uh, things happening too fast, would be uh, more similar to a plebiscite in the Roman circus, up or down, than an actually measured process of looking at issues, evaluating candidates' positions on issues, and voting people into office. That, I, I do worry about speed. I, I think speed is one of the enemies of democratic processes. I want to speak democracy at large, but the processes by which democracy works and functions uh, is at odds with, and, and I have colleagues who, who have been writing about this, that basically speed, for example, favors populism. <coughs> Very raw rhetoric that uh, uh, appeals to people's emotions, to people's basis common denominators, identitarian common denominators. That, that, so, so, so in that sense, I'm a skeptic. Richard, do you want to comment? Yeah, I mean, it's of course possible, um, but I think on balance it's going to favor the specific, speedy, negative agenda, usually one item on that agenda kind of uh, process. I mean, you know, this is probably not how you intended this uh, question, but I mean, it certainly can be used to build an agenda. I mean, more human beings, uh, Donald Trump must have the biggest megaphone of any human being ever who's existed on this earth, right? Because, you know, through I mean, Twitter is like having a newspaper with 60 million readers that pass it along to all their friends immediately, right? And, and all this other kind of stuff. And, and so everybody knows what the Trump agenda is. I mean, you know, my friends in Australia wake up in the morning, they know what the Trump agenda is, right? So he's built out an agenda and he's used social media extremely. It's almost impossible to imagine Donald Trump without Twitter these days, right? Um, so he's built out an agenda. But that's within the context of an institution, you know, I mean, it's a very different kind of scenario. I just think that. Um, unless you have, I mean, really, when you look at these sort of revolutionary moments, the difference between having a, a movement with a, with a charismatic leader and not is all the difference in the world. And the, but the technology. Now you're charismatic on Twitter. Well, right, but, but yes. Um, and, but you also have to, I mean, the charismatic leader who builds a campaign and has followers and it sort of builds on itself and then ultimately, you know, over usually, I mean, if you look at how these things work, usually it's been over a period of years. And now you're talking, you know, you go to Tahrir Square and within two weeks Mubarak's gone and, you know, it's leaderless. And I think technology is just a huge accelerant in that. And it's very hard to see um, the, the balance being on the other side where the charismatic leader you know, builds over years with technology. So, I mean, it's possible, but I, but I think it's on one side. We're, we're going to wrap up, but I, I want to um, allow just a couple more quick questions. Eileen, and then just... I just wanted to get back to the issue about AI affecting um, the labor market. Just recently, a couple weeks ago, PBS Frontline aired a program, uh, maybe two-hour program on AI, which was excellent, and I recommend everyone watch it. And they interviewed a local union guy somewhere in maybe Michigan. Um, but automation at their auto plants displaced so many workers that the town is, is, is a ghost town. And they also talked to yeah. truck drivers who were told that there were um, a lot of advances being made on driverless trucks in that one trucking company in this country is now doing that. So I think that, uh, and of course, um, that sort of job loss as a result of AI automation is going to, it can't help but increase the gap, the inequality gap. So I think that uh, the AI automation, uh, it might just be beginning, but I think it's going to have an effect on the labor market, and that's what our political candidates should be thinking about. And, and in the interest of time, let me take 
There was another question here somewhere. Let me take that one, and then we'll get our speakers to comment on both of them. Thank you so much. Um, so after 2000, uh, Russia, for example, has established the doctrine uh, that regulates the physical space the same way as the online space. Um, and European countries at the same time have started to combat the information warfare together. So to Richard's point, uh, I wanted to ask or to elaborate to what degree, why is it so that, uh, for example, countries don't work together, NATO countries, really to combat information warfare together, as some countries in Europe do that. Uh, what are the obstacles that you see, either internal or are there inter-country uh, issues? Um, just quick on the AI and automation displacing workers, it certainly displaces workers, but the entire course of economic history has shown, at least to this point, unless it's totally different than in the past, that over time it actually creates higher value jobs. I mean, the, you can go to, Col to California and see ghost towns where gold miners were once working and they stopped because the gold ran out. Or you can, the buggy whip, you know, industry didn't do well after the invention of the automobile. I mean, all economic change has winners and losers. Um, and it's, you know, it's very bad for the people who had their profession in whatever is being either automated or replaced by trade with another country or something like that. But never in economic history has it been that it's had a net decrease in jobs and you've got to kind of have a universal basic income where, you know, the owners of capital sort of pay everybody not to revolt, you know, and, and things like that. So I'm just very skeptical that we're going to, that, that automation is, is going to just throw hundreds, you know, tens of millions of workers out that are unable to find jobs. And those jobs, at least again, if you look at economic history, will actually be higher value jobs. And so it could actually reduce inequality. We still know, right? So, um, so on that, the, the, on the information warfare um, thing, I mean, NATO is doing some talking about, you know, information warfare, and they do a lot on cybersecurity within the defense sphere. There's a decent amount of um, intelligence sharing that goes on between particular countries like Japan and Australia and the United States and things like that. But thus far, these um, what we're talking about is sort of, when we're talking about attacks on democracy, whether it's disinformation or attacks on voting machines and things like that, first of all, you're talking about a spectrum of very different activities. And then you're talking about things where the authorities to deal with that are usually not even at the national level. I mean, voting thing, you're talking about local and state officials and things like that. Um, and so it just has not aggregated to how do we deal with this. I think it can aggregate, particularly on the response side. I think it's a lot harder on the defense side. I mean, if, if, if France came to us and said, as a good ally, we want to help you protect your local voting machines or something, we would say, well, I mean, thank you for your interest, but, you know, what, what do you want? They, they don't even trust the federal government to help with that half the time. Um, but so it's on this response side. It's on the raising the cost side that I think a lot more needs to be done. One, uh, the, David Sanger has a very scary book called I think, The Ultimate Weapon about uh, cyber hacking and cyber security. And he addresses the, you know, the fact that there are six, seven, eight countries that could bring down you know, the infrastructure of any one of us. And, and one of the challenges to the kind of, that he talked about to the collective response to these kinds of threats is that we know about these threats because of hacks that we have uh, in other countries' systems. And you know, we don't want to share um, the, with that country and often with other countries that we have that particular hack because once it's shared, then it's no longer of use. And so, there's a, so when, when, you know, when a tank crosses into the Baltics, you can all see that. And you can see where it came from. But with the, with, you know, when, when uh, Iran attacks our, you know, some, some, some company, here, it's, it's much harder to establish credi with credible evidence that you're willing to share that they took that action and, and that you need that in order to get people to come together to take a collective response. So it's, you know, I don't know what the answer to that is, but it's a re it, is a, it is a challenge. Really quick, yes, very one. quickly, what, what I really worry about is not um, um, to say, you know, this is false, this is, this is, this is correct, this is true but that our ability to make that distinction is becoming more and more yeah. impaired. And so I really worry less about, uh, I mean, attacks on infrastructure, these are, these are major uh, war. This is like, you know, you bring down the electrical grid. This is, it's, it's a war act. I worry more about our literal inability to talk to each other. 
How can you have a functioning democracy if you have bubbles that are predominantly driven by digital media uh, that are so micro-targeted, so, so isolated, perhaps in some cases as isolated as, as you know, being in China uh, uh, swapping your Alipay phone to, to buy uh, three kumquats, Thank right? Um, I, I do worry about this much more than the big um, cyber attacks. I think this is something immediate that's on a, going on a daily basis. It's not an eventful thing, but it's a daily erosion of our ability to speak with each other, to mount, uh, to, to compromise. We've lost the ability to forge compromise. All right. this, is, this is a major threat to democracy, I believe. And it's largely driven by digitally created bubbles that are self-reinforcing, that keep growing, and where the overlap is becoming less and less. On that dismal note. You're going to close with some optimism? <laughs> Can you sum up with some optimism for all of um, I think I think the kinds of thoughts uh, which are really um, at a level of sophistication that has uh, is, is transformed since just prior to the 2016 election. If you think about the sorts of discussions we were having back then about technology, it was so um, really uh, limited in our understanding of the national security dimensions. Um, of technological change uh, were really so limited. Uh, it has been a, a, a painful learning uh, curve that we have all moved up uh, steeply, but I think um, the topics that we're talking about now are the most deeply interdisciplinary topics, and it's all, all the pieces of it, the communications piece, the legal piece, the national security piece, the technology piece, uh, foreign relations piece, it is all necessary to pull together um, to protect and, and um, preserve our democracy. So we have to keep having conversations like this. And another optimistic piece is we have a lovely reception waiting for you, and we <laughs> hope that you will all join us. I'd like to thank our panelists, thank the Kerry Boone